but everybody pl- please be seated. Everyone, please be seated. get a hold of the spirit of the first church or it ever gets a hold of us to the extent that the world calls us fools and fanatics and start mad and insurrectionists and go so far to say these are they that have turned the world upside down then we shall be on the high road to capture this planet for Jesus Christ And when sorrow is the only game in town, and when life has thrust a willow into your hand, I'll tell you what do. Pick up your willow and get out there and worship and praise and dance before the Lord just like you did with a palm branch. I can tell you there is going to be a rainbow of deliverance in your cloud of care. Is anybody here going to identify with Jesus? Is anybody going to identify with the Apostle Peter? He's gone now. Do we have anybody else that carries casket? That carries coffin? 
Is anybody going to carry the coffin of Peter? Is anybody going to carry the coffin of the Apostle Paul? Who's going to carry it on? The dreamer, dream on, brother, dream. Dream on, brother, dream. Honey, I'm going to take some devil ain't such a big bad booger. He ain't even got the keys to his own house. He ain't going to lock you up. He can't even lock his own house up. I said he can't even lock his own house up. Your father's got the keys of death and hell. Your father's got the keys of authority and power and release. The devil is saying it can't be done, but Jesus Christ said it's already done. It's already done. Take it. Take it. Take it. He hates it. He trembles. He fears. The devil does not have us on the run. We have the devil on the run. We've got him on the run. of us. He is afraid of you. He's afraid of us. He hopes that we never come out of our corner. But this conference has got us out of the corner. This because of the times has got us out of the corner. And before the night's over, you're going to see the Lamb. And you're going to see further and you're going to say, this is the mountain I've been looking for. It's a permanent experience. I've been permanently changed. It's not just hype. I see things. I understand things because I'm looking at it through the eyes of the Lamb. And I vow that I'll follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. Hallelujah, because I've seen the Lamb. I'm coming out of confusion because this is our day. Y2K says this is our day. The world is disturbed. I'm not going to get involved in all that, but I'm going to get in the middle of it. I'm going to say while everybody's all shook up, I'm going to shake up the church. I'm going to say this is the greatest hour to have revival. Praise God. And they have learned how to preach and help nobody. It ain't no problem in your church that preaching won't fix. It ain't no situation that preachers can't deal with if you'll just preach. You got a problem in your church? You don't need to bring in no behavior scientist with a PhD talking 13 cylinder triple jointed knee action words. Just preach. Preaching don't do it because God designed preaching to do it. That's, I, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about laying aside. I'm talking about some things we've got to unpack. I'm talking about we're carrying a bunch of junk that there's no way that we're going to... There's no way we're going to be the church that God has intended for this day when we're about that mature and deep. Possible. Whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're new to ministry, or whether you're a seasoned veteran, don't quit now! Don't stop! You're three feet away! You're three feet from that breakthrough! Three feet from the greatest revival your church has ever seen! You're three feet from the greatest sermon you've ever preached! You're three feet away from your miracle! You're three feet away from being able to leave deputation early! You're three feet away from starting that new building program. You're three feet away from the best song that's ever been written. Three more feet. Don't quit now. Not now. I got to convince somebody today, you can do this thing. You can win souls. You can build a church. You can't see miracles. You can't buy property. You can't see a move of God.
some reason in God's world we become more valuable. We can be crushed through rejection, misunderstanding, betrayal, abuse, all leaving us as though we just have no world or no worth and it's all gone. But God. There is no spiritual blessing ever enjoyed that cannot be yours. Shout hallelujah. Say, I'm going after it then. Say, if somebody else got it, I want it, and it's for me, and I'm going to have it. It's going to happen in my city. It's going to happen in my church. Revival. Breakthrough. The pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's right there.
that are watching by way of the web. It's my honor as pastor here at the POA to welcome you to Because of the Times 2024. It has not been easy to get to this point over the last year. There has been chaos in our world. Confusion and deception abound. Wars are being fought and we have been fighting the devil at every turn. He's been spreading his destruction and deception all across this globe. Even over the last 48 hours, it feels as though hell fears what may come this week. And I know there are men and women in this very room and watching by way of the web. You're at a crossroads. Crossroads in your family. Crossroads in your ministry. The fight has been long. The fight has been hard. And your will is being tested even now. I say to you and I say to me, welcome to Because of the Times where I am believing for a rejuvenation, a reinvigoration. I'm believing that direction and supernatural strength will flood you this week. The 40th because of the times, even at your seat there was a coin there that commemorates that. 40th because of the times over the last 42 years. We missed one for the World Conference in Jerusalem and one because of COVID. But this is the 40th because of the times. What a significance. No man with 100% certainty can declare what numbers mean in the Bible. But we can glean from Scripture that there are particular numbers associated with meanings and types and shadows. The number 40 in the Old Testament is accepted by most biblical references as the end of one generation and the beginning of a new. We've had a whole generation of because of the times. We've heard great preaching. We've heard great teaching. Prophecy has gone forth. We've been motivated. We've been challenged. We've been chastised. All so that God's church his bride could be launched into a new year with the tools and the strength needed to endure. 
and endure we have. We are still standing, we are still fighting, and we are still believing for greater things that are to come. We are being launched into a new generation of because of the times. And I would never, never disrespect the men and women who have brought us to this most monumental moment in history. But I believe with everything that is within me, the next generation will be greater than the former. Not in talent, not in gifting, not in ability. But I believe that double portions fall on succeeding generations. And should the Lord tarry, a double portion will fall on the next generation after this one, and they will be greater. These past 40 years have been preparing us for what is to come, which I believe is the last day revival. The number 40 also signifies a time of preparation for a release of God's promise. And it's not always easy. For 40 years, the children of Israel were prepared to step into their land of promise through going through the wilderness. For 40 days, Jesus prepared his mind, soul, body for his earthly ministry. For 40 because of the times. Though it hasn't always been sunshine and roses, there's been moments of pain, hurt, difficulty, and hardship. There's been moments of great blessing. All in preparation, leading us to this moment where I believe that God is wanting to pour out a double portion anointing. So this week, I am claiming a double portion anointing on this new generation of Because of the Times. I am claiming a double portion anointing as we embark on another 40 years. I speak boldly, and I'm no prophet. I'm not a prophet, but I speak boldly that there will be men and women who will accept that double portion anointing in their lives this week, and you will step into your land of promise where God has promised you some things, promised you that ministry, promised you that revival, promised you that next level in your ministry. This is the week where you say, God, pour it out on me. This is the week where you claim that double portion anointing as you step into that ministry. I speak in the name of Jesus, men and women, in this house and across the web, we'll accept that double portion anointing this week, and you will launch the ministry as it did for Jesus. We'll launch your ministry that God called you to. I proclaim in the name of Jesus, there will be a double portion anointing that will fall on us this week as we leave one generation and step into the next. An anointing so powerful that the church would arise and say, Rejoice not against me, O oh, mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. There is an anointing that is going to fall on you this week that is going to give you the boldness to look at our adversary and say, Rejoice! not against me. Let's all stand together. For just a few moments, I wish we would join together in prayer, throw our hands in the air, and claim and commit to our friends, our family members next to us, and to God. This week, when you pour out that double portion, I will be ready for whatever you have. Let's throw our hands in the air and accept what God is going to do this week. Pour it out on us this week, God, as we leave one generation and move into the next. Pour out a double portion on us, God. 
Let it fall like fire from heaven. Let a coal with a double portion anointing smite our lips this week. We, the church, we are arising. I commit to you, God. I commit to you, God. If you'll pour it out, I'll do it. I'll go. I'll use it. Pour it out on me, God. Pour it out on us, God. I want to be a willing vessel this week. I arise to say, pour it out. If we will arise, God will arise. If we step out in boldness, he will meet us. He's going to pour it out on us this week. So glad to have all of you. Welcome to Because of the Times. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you for enduring the elements and going out of your way to make special uh, things to get here. I know many of you changed flights and left early and drove and did many things. Thank you for making the special effort to be here. You're not going to regret it. God's going to pour out something this week. To all that are here, thank you. To our other organizations that are here, it is on, and an honor to have all of you with us. Thank you for being with us here this evening. But we are a part of the greatest organization in the world, the United Pentecostal Church International. So glad to be a part of the UPCI. And we are led by the greatest leaders anywhere in the world. And brother and sister Bernard, we give you tremendous honor. And as Bishop said last night, he's like the Energizer Bunny. As long as he wants to keep going, he can keep going. He's got our full support. We love you. We're behind you 110%. Lead and we will follow. Thank you for being with us. Let's go to the Lord in worship for just a moment.
great atmosphere of praise and worship. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, media team, I think they gave you some things. I'm going to start in a few minutes with the pictures, not the scripture. So if you can change that around, I don't know what you could do or what they told you to do. But uh, don't start with the scripture. I'm going to start in a few minutes with three pictures. So if you can figure that out. But I want to talk to you tonight for a few minutes. And I do say, I want to say how much I appreciate Pastor Gentry Mangan and Bishop Anthony Mangan. I don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. You don't have to have me every year. But we've, I feel like this is one of the crucial events of the entire year. And uh, I, I want to talk to you tonight. I'm going to preach just a little bit, but we got a great preacher coming after me. So I'm not worried about that too much. But I do want to share a few things that I feel God put on my heart. And God gave me a word, I feel, for me personally. And then today I feel like it was confirmed to me personally. So then I want to share it with you and you can see if it fits you. But I want to start by saying God is doing something in our fellowship. Now we appreciate all the apostolic groups sincerely. And we want to work in harmony. But I want to just tell you what is happening in the area where I have more direct knowledge. And that's the United Pentecostal Church International. And we've tried to press forward. I feel like I have two priorities as a general superintendent at this point in my ministry. Number one is to keep pushing growth in every dimension. Strengthen our churches. Grow our churches. And increase our ministers and churches. When I say churches, I include the self-governing, but I also include those that aren't self-governing, which we call daughter works and preaching points. But they're all churches, baby churches or uh, churches in the making or mature churches. But I feel like we've got to keep pressing forward. We call it Strategic Growth Initiative, SGI, strength, growth, and increase. But the second priority is we need a healthy church culture. It's not enough to have more churches. We have to have churches that know how to love, know how to minister, know how to disciple, know how to bring to maturity. Not churches where there's intimidation and abuse and dysfunction, or, but churches that know how to take lost people and broken people and hurting people and bring hope and healing and new life. It's not just about numbers. It's not even just about baptisms. It's about bringing people to Christ where their lives are changed and they're ready for heaven. Amen. But when you look, and, and I just want to, again, just share a few things. So I, I, five things that to me are in, that we've got to emphasize that sometimes we haven't. Number one is team ministry. We're talking about the five-fold ministry. That means all of us need to work as a team. We respect the pastor as the leader of the local church. But a wise pastor will develop relationships with the five-fold ministry where it's not just that pastor that's the only influence in the church, but there is a team that is influencing that church. But there also needs to be a team within the church we call the priesthood of believers. Every believer is a priest unto God. Every believer can intercede for him or herself, and every believer can intercede for others. It doesn't, we're not talking about authority taking away from the pastor. We're talking about the pastor empowering the church and releasing the gifts that are within the saints so that we recognize the, the team ministry within the local church. That's the key to health. Team ministry. Second thing is servanthood leadership. As a leader, the quote, higher you think you should go, the more you should serve. Leadership in the kingdom is about service. Number three is accountability and shared governance. We need to be accountable to one another. 
We need to be accountable to our own people. We need to share the decision making and the leadership. And we'll be stronger if we learn to do that. Number four, effective transitions. Seems like I've had to deal with that more and more. We've got to plan those transitions. And we've got to plan those retirements. Now, you can preach to the day you die, but you have to have some effective transition from one phase of ministry to the next phase of ministry. And then finally, Christian liberty. There is probably within the UPCI more agreement on the doctrine of salvation and even on the teachings of holiness. We're not having major controversies over anything we believe. And those who've been around a while, you know that has not always been the case. There are always going to be people coming and going. There are going to always be people on the fringes. But in the past, it seems like those on the fringes were right in the middle of the fight getting all of us stirred up every year. But now those in the fringes just keep moving on somewhere else. And so we, we have more, I believe, more doctrinal unity and strength. But what we must learn, there is such a thing as Christian liberty. In certain things, we might have differences of opinion with, and allow differences within the local church and allow differences among churches because we agree on the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures, I hope. And uh, this year I went to Corinth. And so if they got the first picture, we'll see if they, there it is. That is called the Acro Corinth. That is the citadel of ancient Corinth. At the top of that mountain was the stronghold. Below was the major city. So in time of conflict, they could retreat to the stronghold. At the top of that stronghold was a giant temple to Aphrodite or Venus. So it dominated the whole area. Now to understand Corinth, I'm still looking at that picture, it's at a narrow isthmus, a narrow piece of land that connects northern Greece or central Greece where Athens is to southern Greece. And so that one city, Corinth, controlled the north-south trade. At the same time, the sea came in on both sides. On the east, the Aegean, the west, the Ionian. There was a narrow little strip of land that separated the east from the west. Now, today, they have a canal that connects it. Ancient times, they had a track where they would haul the boats from one sea to the other sea. They would pull them across. In other words, Corinth controlled the east-west trade. Because otherwise, people would have to go all the way around Greece to go from east to west to sail. So they controlled the north-south trade, the east-west trade. So they were one of the most richest cities of ancient Greece because they were in control of the central economy of Greece. Uh, they were conquered by the Romans, destroyed, but then Rome rebuilt the city. And so ancient Corinth was a wealthy city. Think of it as a cosmopolitan city, a city of trade, city of commerce, city of taxes, sailors coming and going from all over the world. Well, you can also think of what kind of city that is. Uh, they said, and some historians debate whether it's an exaggeration, but they said at the height, you know, they had what's called sacred prostitution at that temple of Aphrodite. Some say as many as 1,000 prostitutes. Others say that was an exaggeration. Regardless, it was so widespread that the Greek word to Corinthianize was a term for fornication. So if you said, you're a Corinthian, you Corinthianize, that was known all over the ancient world is what that meant. That was their reputation. Another famous ancient saying is not everybody could afford to go to Corinth. It was so wealthy, so rich, so lavish, and when you did go, you expect to spend a lot of money on all these different things. And so the ancient saying was, not everyone can go to Corinth. Not everyone has the resources to go to Corinth. That's the city. Now, I've got another slide somewhere. The second slide, this is the remnant. So down below where I was taking the picture from is dominated by this temple, the temple of Apollo built in 560 B.C. So absolutely, when Paul was there, 
he would have seen this temple. So if you look up to the citadel, the temple of Aphrodite controls the whole area. If you look where everybody's living down below, the temple of Apollo controls the whole area. That set the tone for that culture. Now, one more picture. Here is the Bema, the place of judgment, the ruins. It's a platform. It looks low on one side, but big on the other side. That is called the judgment seat or the speaker's platform. Probably Paul preached from that platform. We do know he was uh, arrested and uh, brought before court, and then he was dismissed. So he was definitely there on trial at that particular spot. Some of those stones, the apostle Paul would have stood on those very stones. Now that was the environment where Paul was sent to build a church. Gross immorality, wealth and luxury, people not needing a message to change their life. They were happy with their life, theoretically. So it was a situation dominated by pagan gods, by pagan culture. Everything was in place. There was no place for the gospel, seemingly. You know, I got to thinking about that. Isn't that somewhat like today? We used to be a basically Christian nation, at least basic values, but we can't really say that anymore. Look at the economy. Are you happy with the way the economy is going? Look at politics. Are you happy with the way politics is going? The government, the, the education system, the entertainment system, the media, are, is, is there any, anything you're excited about or you're thrilled about? There's turmoil. There's chaos. It seems like truth is under attack. Even the very concept that there is such a thing as truth is under attack. Godly morals are under attack on every turn. And Brother Tipton and I had a meeting today with the, the, we're talking about the NACLC, the National Apostolic Christian Leadership Conference. And we're, we're facing fights where there is a serious movement to take away tax exempt status from churches. And we're going to try to partner with people and fight that. There's a serious attempt to undermine uh, on schools, to undermine the very concept of male and female, and to take away rights even from private schools and private institutions and places like Tupelo Children's Mansion to tear down the very basis of what we believe. It's an intimidating, scary time. And legal tactics are being used. And then something unprecedented you know, I, I'm not, uh, I don't claim to have a thorough comprehension of end time prophecy, but I will say this. If you look at Ezekiel, you look at Zechariah, you look at Revelation, you look at Daniel, we all have a, a basic understanding that these are the end times. We all know there's an evil ruler coming that will rise up. He will attempt to take political control, economic control. And uh, at some point, Jesus Christ will come back to earth, the valley, the, 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 the Battle of Armageddon, and so forth. So we all understand that. And people throughout the ages have believed that. But I would say we are the first generation to actually know how it could come to pass. So past generations have believed there would be a world economic system. You don't have to have faith to think that. You can see how it could be implemented. A world political system. Uh, a world ruler that can project an image to everybody in the world. Past generations preach that that would happen. We are the first generation to say, we have the technology and the culture by which it could be done now. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to guess. We know how it could happen. And then what's happening in the Middle East, the whole world coming together. Now we saw that some years back in the Iraq war, the whole world coming to fight in the Middle East. And of course, we know Jerusalem, Jesus talked in Luke about the times of the Gentiles, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles at the time of the Gentiles to be fulfilled. So in our lifetime, and some of us at least, we saw the Six Day War, we saw Jerusalem conquered, and, and we saw Israel taking control of their ancestral lands. And we know there's going to be a great b battle against that tiny nation. And from a logical point of view, it doesn't make sense. Why would the whole world fight over this tiny piece of territory? 
But from a scriptural point of view, we know it's going to happen. And uh, I don't know the whole thing. I've always thought the Antichrist won't have perfect control. He'll be trying to get control, but there will be people fighting him. So I've always, I've always hoped America will be one of those nations that's going to stand on the right side. But for the first time, I'm seeing multitudes of Americans, particularly young people, who are saying, let's kill the Jews. Let's destroy the Jews. And my heart hurts for my country because I can no longer be assured that America is going to be standing on the right side. It could be that we're not. And for me, that's something new. That's a revelation. That's scary. I don't know how soon the end will come, but literally we could wake up tomorrow morning and all those events will be falling into place. There's nothing this impossible that could not come to pass within days, weeks, months. That's unprecedented. Now, we've always preached these kind of things, but we've never been at the place where all those things could fall into place today, tomorrow, next week, boom, 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 and there we are. Whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib, it could all fall into place. We could be right there. It's a scary and depressing thought. But then the word of the Lord came to Paul. In my text in Acts chapter 18, verse 9 through verse 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. Not saying no one will attack you. But no one will attack you to hurt you. You're not going to be destroyed. You're not going to be silenced. You're not going to lose. For I have many people in this city. I think that word applies just as much to us. So we think of the great apostle Paul. He wouldn't be intimidated by anything. But I think when he went to Corinth and he saw the Acro Corinth and there's the temple of Aphrodite, there's the prostitutes. That's the culture of the city. That's the spirit of the city. He looks around, there's the temple of Apollo. He sees the luxury, the wealth, the political power, the economic power, the gross immorality, no semblance of any kind of biblical values even Paul was intimidated because why did God say do not fear I'm not criticizing I'm saying he, they, there was a bit of intimidation because God had to speak to him said now Paul do not be afraid without me you're going to be afraid but I'm telling you you do not need to fear don't think about shutting your voice don't think about riding off in the sunset. Don't think about muting your message because I have many people in this city. A great apostolic revival. Here's my message. An apostolic church in Corinth. An apostolic church in Corinth. You fill in the blank. An apostolic church in Ohio. An apostolic church in Wisconsin. An apostolic church in California. An apostolic church in Washington, D.C. Can we do it? Yes, we can do it. Don't worry about the culture. Don't be intimidated about the legal system. Don't worry about the end time prophecy it'll take place but until Jesus comes we will build an apostolic church in Corinth and it's not just about numbers but don't think small don't just say, well, just, we'll just be faithful to the end. Just a few of us left. Just a little remnant. No, I have many people. You're looking at this. Paul, it looks impossible. You'd be glad just to get a Bible study. But Paul, I have a multitude right here. All you see is the pagan culture. All you see is the luxury and licentiousness. But I see a church. I see an apostolic church. I see many people in your city. 
I'm almost through. NLT. Don't be afraid. Exclamation point. Speak out. Explanation point. Don't be silent. Exclamation point. For I am with you, and no one will attack you and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. I know it's a prophecy to Paul in the first century. But can, do you think, you pray about it. If you feel that's a word to you, you go home and you claim it. Don't be afraid of whatever's coming against you, internal or external. Don't be silent. Don't stop preaching. Don't stop teaching. Don't stop talking. Because God says, many people in this city belong to me. Many people are part of my church. They're on the way. They need a preacher to preach them into the church. And then, this is my last point. So was that really fulfilled? Did that ever come to pass? First Corinthians. Now you know why there were so many problems in that church. Kind of like some of our churches, right? So I wouldn't brag about it, but if you face some of the problems they faced in First Corinthians, you can say, well, we're apostolic. Apostolic church. That's what apostolic church deal with. Abuse of spiritual gifts, dealing with immoral situations, we've got to straighten out. That's, that's apostolic. But 1 Corinthians 6, if you just read 9 and 10, God's going to bring judgment on idolaters and drunkards and the homosexual practitioners and the adulterers and the fornicators and the long depressing list of all kinds of sin. You think, man, he has to tell this to the church. He has to say, you better be careful. God's judgment will come on this and this and this and this and this. But then verse 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you. I told you, Paul, I had many people in this city, in this immoral, licentious, luxurious, worldly city. I told you I had a lot of people, and Paul is testifying, and such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. Hey, that's the new birth. How are you justified? You want to know, Protestants, how you're justified? In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We have the name of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. That's how you're going to build an apostolic church, not on a generic message, but you're going to build it on baptism in Jesus' name, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Such were some of you. You were washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. It's time to rise. It's time to arise. Let's build an apostolic church in Corinth. Oh, let's praise the Lord right now. for just a moment. Speak it over your city for just a moment. Claim that word from our bishop. Revival in my city. For he hath not given me a spirit of fear, but one of power of love and a sound mind. I'm moving forward. I'm having revival. This world's not going to stop me. No enemy's going to stop me. He can't stop the church. Thank you for that word, Bishop. I claim that in Jesus' name. I claim that in Jesus' name. Praise God. You confirm some things for me, Bishop. I'm preaching tomorrow night. I'm scared to death. But you've confirmed some things for me. I'm glad to be a part of the church. We're moving forward. 
The greatest days are ahead. Praise God. You can be seated. Once again, I do say welcome to everybody, all of our guests that are with us here tonight. I want to share just a few things with you. We do have a hospitality lounge and concessions. The BOTT Hospitality Lounge is located at the entrance of the GA Mangan Center near the White Steeple Bookstore. That would be sort of this direction. Complimentary coffee is served along with light snacks available for purchase. Feel free to take advantage of that throughout the conference. Our schedule for tomorrow is going to be a great day. Beginning at 9.30 a.m., we have a forum rising to the challenge of culture. Our moderators will be Paul and Brooke Pamer, and our participants will be David McGovern, Ross Robertson, and Tyler and Tennille Whaley, followed by Sister Vesta Ming. And we are glad that she is able to speak this year. And then Brother Jim Blackshear is going to deliver the word after that, and I'm excited for what the Lord has given him for this meeting. I do want to welcome a few of our officials and our, our honored guests here tonight. We are honored to have uh, many of our general officials and our Louisiana officials. Once again, I do reckon, uh, uh, recognize Brother and Sister Bernard, our general superintendent, Brother Stan Gleason, our assistant general superintendent, Brother Scott Graham our general secretary, so glad that you are here. Adam Hunley, our general director of global missions. First time get to say that. And we are also very honored to have our global missions director emeritus, Brother Hal, honored that you are here with us. General director of North American missions, Brother Scott Sistrunk, and to our, children, our general children's ministry director, Brother Steve Cannon. Our general youth director, Brother DJ Hill. Glad that our general board is here with us. Thank you so very much, our general officials. Also very, very honored. Uh, and I am biased, of course, but we live and we pastor in the greatest district in the union, the Louisiana district. And we are so very honored to have brother and sister Daryl Weber with us, our district superintendent of Louisiana. Incredible man and woman of God, we love you and we follow you and support you. And a member of this church and singing in our choir, our Louisiana District Secretary, Brother Brandon Stroud, great man of God, we love you. And his wife, yes ma'am. Special guests that we do have with us tonight, honored, honored guests that are our guests of Bishop and I tonight, Pastor Joshua Joy, Darren, his wife, Elizabeth, they are fellow pastors in our community, great man and woman of God. We love you dearly. Thank you for being with us. And also the president of Louisiana Christian University, Dr. Rick Brewer, it is an honor to have you with us tonight. Thank you. And as we do every year on Tuesday night, it is an honor to have the greatest human beings in the building, our preacher's kids. Can we welcome them? <laughs> Praise God. Our church here at the POA is blessed with the greatest bishop and wife anywhere in the world, Bishop Anthony and Sister Mickey Mangan. He is, he led, he led. Keep leading because of the times. <laughs> Keep on carrying it on and we'll pick it up when you need help. You leave the church to me though. <laughs> He's the greatest bishop anywhere in the world. He and Uncle Mike had a vision for this meeting. They have carried it very well for 40 years. They will continue to carry it. We will continue to help you. We love you. Deliver the word of the Lord to us tonight as the Lord has given it to you. Let's all stand together as we go to the Lord in worship and let's usher in a powerful presence of God in this service. Raise our hands. 
all across this room and just usher in the presence of God that we know is already here. Lord Spirit, move in this place, oh God. Yeah. Oh. I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit. Come like a fire, like a fire. Holy
Nothing like that name. The exalted in our praise. Nothing like that name. Oh, our name. Hallelujah. That name. Shout to that name. We speak your name, Jesus. We speak your name, Jesus. If you don't mind, and you can forget COVID a moment, would you reach over and grab the person's hand beside you and would you raise it to heaven and let a shout come out in this congregation for the things that God has done. Thank you to this great choir. Pastor Cam, just unbelievable. Why aren't y'all that good all year long? Uh, just great. And then you great men and women of God, what a privilege it is to have you. And I am quite emotional and have been for a couple weeks. So uh, allow me to negotiate my feelings tonight because for 40 years over there or either here, I have walked to this pulpit and God has done a great work. And pastor, I'm convinced that God is gonna do his greatest work this week and we're gonna see the greatest revival that the apostolic church has ever seen. I give honor to all of our leaders, brother and sister Bernard and everyone that Gentry recognized I thank God for them. And to my mother, uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very powerful statement, mother, so I want you to remember it. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And I thank God for my mother. I'd like to recognize her. Would you do that? Because just a few months ago, that was touch and go. When they had opened her up, from the top all the way down, about as low as you can go, and went in there, and the doctor said within 24 to 48 hours she would have been dead if we wouldn't have got there. Her colon, portion of her colon had died, and there was no blood going through her colon. But God. <laughs> can I just tell you something funny? None of this was on my agenda. You'll like this one. None of this was on my agenda. We was riding home from my aunt's house the other day, who's 95 years old, still driving all over Dallas. For those of you who leave there, you may want to be a little careful. But we was driving home and she said, you know, Anthony, Aunt Nora has asked you to preach her funeral. And I said, and I got a little sentimental. And I said, yes, mother, I, I, I know that and I do it. She said, but if you don't mind, I'd like to say a few words. Only my mother. But it's great, great having y'all. You may be seated in Jesus' name. <clears throat> this has only been out of my safe twice. Once I preached to our church, 
and then last night and tonight. This is my father's Bible. I got four or five of them stacked in my office. But this is the one that was given to him when he was leaving Plymouth, Indiana to go to Apostolic Bible Institute. This was his Bible that he took. This is the Bible that he evangelized with. And I feel it quite an honor, it stays in my faith, to have my dad, to have his word and his word with us tonight. I love you, Dad. Thank you. I'll talk about you tonight. So here we are, 2024. We didn't nearly about think there'd be this many people here last night. But you were determined to get here. Our officials of the United Pentecostal Church, our missionaries, our pastors and wives, our evangelists and teachers and wives, all across this nation to help us together celebrate 40 years of Because of the Times. That has produced more than I can nearly about think about preaching tonight or that our minds to conceive. In the unction of the Holy Ghost and with thanksgiving and praise in my heart for the Shekinah glory presence of God that has filled this place for 40 years. Where more than 50 years in this building and across, we have had unceasing prayer for three hour shift and hundreds coming by here praying during the week, thanks to my father and mother. For the past 40 glorious years, we have gathered in this place, counting the G.A. Mangan Center. When you came in tonight, there was a coin that if you haven't taken it off, uh, don't do it now, wait till it's over, don't look at it now. But it is a coin that Mick and I and the POA and the Because of the Time Committee wanted to give you commemorating our 40 years. We've gathered for a meeting in this place since 1983, specifically designed for ministers and wives with our eyes on the future. There was a time in our organization when because of the time began that there was a hole in our organization. It wasn't spiritually, but there were some men that had great influence on all of our lives that we were missing. So Mike and I went to Brother Tinian, told him what we would like to do, and he said, you need to talk to Brother Urshan. And so we went to Brother Urshan, and Brother Urshan said, great, just keep it under Brother Tinian, Brother Kilgore. And so we started under Brother Tinian, Brother Kilgore, and Brother Urshan. And we would go to Houston every year, and we would meet in a hotel room and plan whatever year that was because of the times. You would have really enjoyed being in some of those meetings, especially with Brother Kilgore. Because when we go to choose a theme, that's one of the first things we did because after we get the theme, we'd start moving towards who's going to speak there. And Brother Kilgore would always have quite an unusual theme. It was usually something along, let's call it prayer, fasting, soul winning, bus routing, door knocking because of the times. So either me or Mike would have to speak up and say, Brother Kilgore, that won't fit on a three by five card. We've got to keep it to four to six words or maybe one word that we can call this theme, but prayer, fasting, Bible studies, bus routes, everything, that just won't fit on there. It was quite a time. The privilege now has been extended through the years to all ministers from that young ministers conference. Always was and always will be with the cooperation of the leaders of the United Pentecostal Church, our general superintendents and officials. We can all learn a good lesson. That's a good place to start. One of his five points was submission. That's the thing that I try to practice in my life is being submitted to those that have authority over my life. And I thank God for our general superintendent. Brother Urshan, I thank God for Brother Haney, and I thank God for Brother Bernard. And I thank God for my district superintendent, Brother Darrell Weber. We have been blessed by great leadership. From the very beginning, most of you were not there the first one. It was over in the GAMC. And I'll never forget that first night. I was in the office and back in the office. And then we'd walk out and turn left to walk on the platform. And when we walked out and the choir walked out, there was a burst of worship that sprang forth in that congregation. 
And it started for the choir walking in, and I know it was probably just for five minutes, but it seemed like for 30 minutes, there was a roar that went up in that congregation of worship and prayer, fervently, joyfully, and people then, that's when everybody came and our church came, people getting the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit operating, and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost was liberating people, prayer lines, people being falling out in the spirit, people leaving drunk in the Holy Ghost, healings, miracles, supernatural wonders, and the list goes on. There was pastors and churches and evangelists and teachers and apostles and prophets and officials and church-appointed leaders and workers. And last night, talking to some of our leaders, they were talking about the changes that happened at this meeting. One of them is sitting on the front row. One of them is now a member of the planning committee. His name is Paul Pamer. His mother and father, Rod and Nan, made a special effort to get him here on his 17th birthday. He was said, it was in that meeting when I was 17 that I set the sail of what God was going to do in my life. Our associate pastor, Andrew Cox, one of the finest men and family you want to meet is married to a great lady. She and, and Jess has decorated this whole place and fixed it up. She's tremendously gifted. I'm thankful for Danielle and what she has done. But sitting in our meeting when we were planning tonight's service, she said, I'll never forget sitting in the balcony and saying, I wonder what it would be like just to be a part of those that are down there on the floor. That's when the minister sat on the floor. I wonder what it would be like. Well, Danielle, you've made it to the floor. And Lex, I give great honor to you. We've been challenged and changed, experienced revival and unceasing prayer. To go on the highways and street meetings and Bible studies. To evangelize our cities and our communities. Wherever the people were, we were told to go to people, go to people, go to people. Reaching and saving the lost. All of this and much, much more. Thousands and thousands more, more impossible to count, both in this nation and around the world. Evidence was speaking with other tongues and people being baptized in the name. And then came the idea of starting because of the times overseas. And we've been to the Philippines and we've been to Africa. And BOTT has touched the world of which I'm thankful for. Churches have been built. Preaching points have been established. Bible schools and prayer chapels have been built to which I'm thankful for. Last year, the Spirit of God began to move when I brought Brother Sergi out. And we brought Sergi out and we talked about Ukraine. And you great men and women of God pledged over $700,000 for the Ukraine work. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> 400,643 of that came in as of two weeks ago. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> so I called Brother Sergi, and with your help and with your money, and in a war-torn nation, Here's what he has now going on over there. Um, thank you so much for all you have done for your support. And we were able to move in. We had our first service. We had to get out from the rent place. And uh, this place is not finished 100%. This is the auditorium. And uh, the first floor still needs to be done. This place, there's a lot of things needs to be done. This room, there's no sound. Really nothing, but we were so glad to be here. Great presence of God. We have 156 chairs. This is all old, old chairs, and it was packed. So I give, give glory to God for this great, great miracle, and thank you so much for your love and your support. Oh, man. That's last Sunday. That ought to make you get on your feet. That's last Sunday. 154 in Ukraine in the building that you helped build last year. No one of us did that, but all of us together. We can never tell the half has not been told. The only explanation for 40 years is the supernatural, the power from on high. It had been the chief vicar in the earth 
and it has given us control. It has affected the world around, not only overseas, but while praying the last few weeks, Terry Spears sent me a clip, and it was from a gospel country singer by the name of Zach Williams who was performing in Kentucky to 22,000 people. You were there. for a reason because here are the verses to that song everybody getting in the back of the van down by the river there's an old church band singing a song and clapping along we're gonna see a revival the old muddy water gonna wash our sins tell everybody to bring their friends hold on tight it might last all night we're gonna have a revival That's that song. So here's the, here's the second verse. Holy Ghost fire gonna set you free. It don't matter if it lasts all week. Fire from falling, falling like rain. Ain't nobody here walking the same. Signs and wonders and trumpet sound. We're riding out of here on a glory cloud. Gotta get a seat, hold your feet. We're gonna have a revival. Well, I'm gonna say it to BOTT. We're gonna have Get off your seat, get out of your seat. We're gonna have a revival. Come on, POA, come on, BOTT. We're gonna have a revival. You may be seated. Zach just wishes he could sing that good. <laughs> because of the times has left a priceless, priceless stamp on our life. Oh, yeah. Seeing and knowing and hearing some of the greatest men and greatest preachers and greatest message and greater singers that the apostolic Jesus name Holy Ghost Church dispensation has ever known. Most of them are no longer with us. They're in that great cloud of witnesses, encouraging us on, 
in church cheering us on. Can't you hear that golden voice of Merle Ewing right now singing that song, I'm going to make it. And he and Ruby and Joan singing the trio, I wouldn't take nothing but my journey now. We're still here. And then my great father, the church here at POA, for 74 years, walk in, don't look to the left, don't look to the right. Pray without ceasing, fast often, have revival until Jesus come. Snatch them out of hell. We got to have revival. He walked in one night. He was preaching because of time. It's the last time he preached here. Wish I'd have had him preach a lot more. He should have been preaching probably instead of me. But he said, I got a message. And I said, yes, sir, Dad. That's why we ask you to preach. He said, well, that first guy usually just has about 30 or 40 minutes. He said, I may go a little longer than that. Don't you rush me. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. And unbeknowing to all of us, he put this whole message together. He planned it all. And I sat there in awe as I watched my father preach one of the greatest messages. There rose a generation after them that did not know the dream. Didn't know the beauty. They lost identity of Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, holiness, they lost it and plunged the world into the worst darkness huh. it's ever been in. You think I'm gonna let him get ahead of me? Yeah. I'm gonna march if it rains, shines, fair weather, good weather, ups or downs. I am going to march. the truth. He's guarding a country. We guard the truth. Let me inspect your uniform. I want to see if you've got the same uniform on that he's got. Let me inspect your gospel shoes too. You got ammunition. If anybody in that sword, they see anybody out there, they have a right to shoot them. <laughs> you got a load of ammunition here. Don't let nobody toy with your brain or your mind. <laughs> Don't let nobody toy with something that somebody died for. I'm guarding, I'm guarding the tomb. I'm guarding Peter's tomb. I'm guarding Paul's tomb. Uh. <laughs> Brothers Tenney's, who was always a step ahead of everybody. Brother Kilgore, Brother Lumpkin, Brother Pugh, Brother Beckton, Brother Urshan, Brother Haney, Brother Williams, Brother Barnes, Brother Billy Cole, and many others now in that great cloud of witnesses. And now our great anointed mighty preachers of the past generation are gone. And God may remove his workers, but the work still goes on. I have had the privilege of holding on to their hand, and I have the privilege of holding on to your hand. And the preaching of the whole gospel to the whole man, to the whole world must go on until in the moment of the twinkling of eye, the trumpet's gonna sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We must occupy till he comes. So 40 years, yes, is this 40th year. And Moses, yes, was there, Pastor Gentry, for 40 years. Moses was a great ambassador. Moses was a deliverer. Moses was a conqueror. Moses was a lawgiver. Moses was a prophet. Moses made a nation out of a mob. He had a burning bush experience. God spoke to him on the backside of a desert. Exodus 3, 1. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will not turn aside and see this great side while the bush is not burnt. 
and the Lord saw. Moses wasn't satisfied with just seeing a bush on fire, but the Lord saw that he turned aside. And God called unto him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father and the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And he became that great leader for 40 years and brother, did he ever lead. He fought back enemy raiders. He put down dissension in the ranks. He gives the jewelry, unity, and law, morality, and faith. He served not only Israel, but he left his mark on the structure of the social and religious humanity of that day. Nobody has ever contended with more than Moses did, and he did that serving God alone. He blessed mankind with some of the greatest gifts that we have ever been given through the Holy Ghost anointed him. He gave us the Ten Commandments written by the hand of God. He gave us the tabernacle that I pray every morning from the opening door to that Ark of the Covenant. He gave us that redemptive plan of that Ark of the Covenant that set in the holy place. God took him from the very gates of Canaan and took him to Mount Nebo and let him see that Canaan land. Yes, I know he displeased God, and yes, I know he didn't get to go in, but the Lord swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I will make unto thee a great seed. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel. Spriking the rock or not striking the rock. There arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And so 40 years we have been here with those great men that are now in the glory crowd. And I didn't know that's the first time that I saw that because they asked me not to watch it. And I saw those seven minute clip when you saw it. But the great men of God that have preached here, my friend, Mike Williams, Brother Jeff Arnold, Brother Huntley, I am so glad to have you here. There has never been anybody preached it because of the times that preach more encouraging messages than you preach. When you got through preaching, we all felt encouraged. <laughs> Brother Stone King and Mickey and, and uh, Mickey last year, your message, you challenged us. You went where no man's in this organization ever thought about walking on mental health. Thank you for that. Sister Tenny and my great mother and all you great preachers and Pastor Terry, I appreciate what you've done to help all this happen. But we close Deuteronomy and we open up the book of Joshua. And when you open up the book of Joshua 1, 1 through 3, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Those 40 years have had a word. The 40 years have been a blessing. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, we're not dead. But Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, Joshua. Go over Jordan, thou and all thy people, unto the land which I give unto thee, even to the children of Israel. In fact, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that I have given unto you as I said unto Moses. They needed something now other than Moses. They needed a skilled warrior. They needed a commander in chief that knew how to war. They needed someone, Pastor Gentry, that knew how to stand up boldly and proclaim the word. And under officer of Jehovah, full of the spirit and wisdom, he said, for Moses had laid his hands upon him and the children of Israel hearkened unto him as did the Lord commanded Moses. And Joshua gained the whole country. He divided the land. He united the people. He was a fearless in battle. He was as sharp as any general that has ever lived. But he did 
what Moses did. He had a personal encounter with the Lord. Moses had a burning bush. Joshua lingered in the tabernacle. When everybody had left, when everybody was gone, Joshua stayed in the tabernacle. He lingered there and he preached two sermons after that that was life changing. And then we get to Joshua 3 and 3. And he said, when we see the ark of the covenant, your God, and the priests and the Levites bringing it in. And when ye shall see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bring it in, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, go after the ark. scripture that ye may know which way to go. We don't know which way to go without the operation of the Holy Ghost in our congregation. This was the symbol of his presence. This was the symbol of Jehovah our God. The ark was that symbol, and we must be prepared to follow when the ark of the covenant moves anywhere at any time. There has to be made space for the ark of the covenant. Thank God for our preachers. Thank God for our universities. Thank God for our colleges. Thank God for our knowledge. We must worship in truth, but we also must worship in spirit. Woe be unto us. Woe be unto us if we think we can get in our churches and operate without this. We are no match for this world. I may be wrong by saying this, but I get scared to death if we go more than three or four weeks without the gifts of the spirits operating in our churches. Where's the gift of tongues and interpretation and prophecy and the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge? We gotta have the Ark of the Covenant in operation. He said, don't, don't get too close. He said, put a space, 2,000 cubits. So the other day in the meeting, I said, how much is 2,000 cubits? It's, 3,000 and something feet, that's a half a mile. Those people follow behind that thing a half a mile. I thought that's right on it, you know, because you weren't supposed to touch it. They, because God wanted to make sure that when he wanted to take a right turn, they could see him taking a right turn. 
And when he wanted to do something with the ark and go somewhere that they may not think they could go, he wanted to make sure that they were far enough back to see where he went. And I am telling you, great men and women of God, particularly the younger generation, get the knowledge, get the word, get educated, learn leadership, put everything in you you can, but you better not try to operate without the Ark of the Covenant. For he said this, he said, you've not passed this way before. Somebody said, oh, back in our day, we had this to go through. No, those of you that's back in that day, you need to come into our day. He said, you hadn't passed this way before. We're having to handle things that our bishop preached about tonight that we didn't think would ever see in many generations, much less in one generation. We can't handle that with just education. You can't handle that with a card in your pocket. You can't handle that with just credentials. You're going to have to have the operation and the demonstration and the anointing of Almighty God. Their entire dependence was on him. Ye have not passed this way before. It's not an issue anymore, thanks to our great leadership that we had. But back when I, it was younger than you, Gentry, but back when I was a young man, we had a great debate on our conference floor one time on whether there were apostles and prophets. I am so glad to declare to you, if you don't believe this, please stay here and finish the week with us at least. But I do want to declare to you, there are apostles, and there are prophets, and there are pastors, and there are teachers, and there are evangelists. And if you want to learn more about it, our assistant superintendent is having meetings. Find where one is, go to it. They can explain it to you far better than I can. But all I know is apostles and prophets are being used, and the prophetic word is going forth, and we as an organization better give honor to the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Ghost and allow the Holy Ghost to operate and move in our congregation. <laughs> Joshua 3 and 7. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day I begin to magnify thee in the sight of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I am going to let them know. Pastor Gentry in your generation, Pastor Andrew in your generation, all you pastors that are here that are their age and younger, let me tell you something. There's going to be anointing rest upon you that's going to be greater as you spoke to Pastor Gentry than any anointing that's arrested upon us. I thank God for Brother Barnes. There's nobody like Brother Barnes. We all want to be like Brother Barnes, but there are gifting in the body of Christ, and he had some giftings that I didn't have. But in this congregation, there are T.W. Barnes in this congregation. No, there can never be another T. Oh, yes, there can be another T.W. Born. Yes, there can be another prophet and apostle. Yes, there can be. He may be 15 or he may be 50, but there are apostles and prophets in this day and time. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm not Brother G.A., and I'm not Brother Tom Barnes, and I'm not Brother Tenny, and I'm not Anthony Mangan, thank God, and I'm not Brother Mike Williams. No, you're greater than that. Get your eyes higher than us. Don't look at us. You're going to be greater than that. You're going to get a double portion. You're going to get a double outpouring. You're going to have a double. God has saved you for the best hour. I turned 74 Friday. I'm on the back side of the mountain. But there's some of you that's coming up on this side of the mountain that's got a greater anointing than any of us that's already walked. God's got Joshua's in this congregation that's going to supersede anything that Moses have done. I'm going to make a statement before I close tonight. And when I make this statement, I want you to shout the statement I'm going to give you back at me. I'm going to say... We can't do it without him. And I want you to shout back at me, he won't do it without us. We can't do it without him. You got it. This glory has passed. Our memorials, our conferences, our camp meetings, 40 years. 
supernatural wonders and mighty revivals in this nation around about. The greatest meeting, including, and, and I don't say this. I've taught those, I've mentored all these sitting here. I've taught them, so I'm not going to say the greatest. I'm going to say one of the greatest. Because I'm sure there's a because of times that may have matched it. But let me just put emphasis on it. One of the greatest meetings in my 74 years of living in three days and three nights was North American Youth Congress. It was an apostolic move of God. Don't worry about our young people. Let's just don't put a lid on them. Turn them loose. Let them prophesy. Let the judgments go. Turn our men and women loose. I told them to go home the night I preached. I said, you get the permission of your pastor because if you're apostle, prophet, Noah, you're submitted to a pastor. And if you're apostle or prophet, you're submitted to a pastor. Everybody needs a man of God they're submitted to. And if you don't have somebody who can say yes in your life and no in your life, you're in the wrong world. You need somebody that can tell you no. That man sits on the front row for me. You need somebody that can tell you no. And when they tell you no, it don't matter how much God you felt, it's no. <laughs> I'm going to get personal here in a moment. This isn't in any of my notes. But I was told no a number of times on my zeal and passion. We went to conference floors with issues, and I was told no. But I kept on looking at those men. I had one, 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 one time sit me down and say, you know, I said, okay, I'm sitting down. But I submitted to everything, and because of that, God blesses you. You stay submitted. You find somebody that can say no to you. You find somebody that can put you in place. And brother, God will raise you up where no man can stop you, and nothing can come against you. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And our general superintendent preached, I think, though I was not there, I was in the hospital with my mother. I think he preached the greatest message that he's ever preached at our general conference on zeal. Brother Bernard, that was a powerful message. So I've witnessed this. I know what I've seen for 74 years, the life-changing gospel. And we're the link between the past and I'm the link to the future. And the former rain and the latter rain are going to be poured out together in a sweeping worldwide revival like we have never seen in our life. But not without us. So I say, arise, starving leper that came here with blisters on the bottom of your feet. And you've been sitting at the gate starving to death. I tell you lepers to arise because God's getting ready to magnify your footsteps and the enemy's going to think it's thousands coming in and you're going to get all their spoil and you're going to get everything they had and you're going to have the greatest revival that you've ever seen and you're going to take back the enemy camp. We can't do it without him. Thank you. He says to us, you do the little things and I'll do the big things. You're warmed up, mother. You're already starting to preach with me. The Philistines headed towards war and Israel were fasting and praying. There's coming to wipe them out. And Samuel cried, offered up a sucking lamb as a burnt offering. And there was a sovereign move of God that thundered and the Philistines were discontented and smitten before the Lord. And they came no more against the coast of Israel all the days of Samuel's life because there was a man of God that knew how to pray. We can't do it without him. Amen. Noah built the ark, but there was a sovereign move of the Spirit that went and got two mosquitoes and two flies and two rats and two snakes and two everything else. That's good preaching, isn't it? 
Brought them in two by two, and that's what this, that's what this did. Brought them into that ark. Little lad walked up to him and said, everybody's hungry. He said, what you got? He said, well, I got two fish and five loaves. He said, that's no problem. We're getting ready to fill 5,000 people. He took that fish and loaf bed and had 12 basketfuls left over. So you figure that one out. That's the God that we serve. <laughs> if you're under 50 in this room, would you stand? You're under 50. Would you stand, please? Oh, Lord. Uh, you may be seated. All of you that's over 50, would you be seated? I don't think there's anybody here. I think somebody must have been lying or something in that deal. We serve communion, I think, tomorrow, so y'all be ready for that. I'm saying to you, arise, you outstanding young men and women to meet your destiny. Again, I say arise. There arise is a great Promised land in front of you that, yes, I want to be a part of it, but it's yours to conquer. I remind you that Moses had his burning bush and Joshua had his time of being left alone at the camp. you got to have that. But, gee, but the Holy Ghost got to speak in or the Holy Spirit or the ark or whatever it was you want to call it in the Old Testament. He said, here's how those walls are coming down. You're going to march six times, and on the seventh day, you're going to march seven times, and on that seventh time, you're going to shout, and you're going to blow the trumpet, and those walls are coming down. I want to ask you a question. Did the walls come down? Because he followed God's command. Joshua heard what God was saying, and he started marching, and he started screaming, and he started blowing trumpets, and the walls fell down. You can't do it without me. The 31 teens that he killed, there's wars he fought. And I guess he's the only man that I ever know of that said, Son, you stand right there and you be still for a while. I got a battle to win. Moses didn't do that. G A N A J T P U, they didn't do that. The 40 generation before, they did great things. They didn't stop the sun. Your greatest, your sun stoppers generation. We were a great generation. We've had 40 years of miracles. We've helped get this organization where it is. But it's nothing to compare to what you're getting ready to do. That's what I want you 50 and 100 to understand. You're getting ready to see the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. I'm, gonna cut, I'm, I'm just going to cut some of my message out because I need to get where I need to get and you need to get out so you can get back tomorrow. And you need to linger and watch. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll allow me just a few minutes, I'm going to go back beyond 40 years. Is that okay? This didn't happen in part of my message until two days ago. But it doesn't have anything to do with 40, but it has everything to do with 40, B-O-T-T. It happened in Plymouth, Indiana. His name was Walter Mangan. That is my father's mother and father. They were very respected in Plymouth, Indiana. My grandfather was a leader of denominal church in that city, the largest church in that city, in Laplace, Plymouth, Indiana. And my grandmother heard that a brush harbor had come to town. And so she hooked up a Reno, Daddy said, that was the name of their horse, and she rode that buggy by herself to that brush harbor. And that night, my grandmother got the Holy Ghost. She just didn't get the Holy Ghost. She got the Holy Ghost in fire. It was, oh. 
She said, I got to get a hold of myself. So she got in that horse and buggy. She rode home from that brush harbor. And she put the horse and buggy up and she was walking and said, I got to be quiet. Walter's in there. If he finds out what happens to me, it will be bad. So get a hold of yourself, Bertha. You can't act that way. She went up to the door. She grabbed the door and the mouth. She said, whoa, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I got the Holy Ghost, Walter. I got the Holy Ghost. He came in. You did what? He said, I got the Holy Ghost. You sleep in the bed. I'll sleep on the couch. I got to, I don't want to hear about it. I got to, I don't want to hear about it. You have ruined the Mangan's name in Plymouth, Indiana. So my grandmother went to the bedroom. My grandfather gets up the next day and goes into the field to work. And those two Pentecostal preachers that God had sent to Laplace went to check on their new convert of the day before. <laughs> Sister Mangan, oh brothers, I love y'all very much and I'm fine, but y'all need to leave. No, we're not leaving. What you want to, we want to see your No, no, you cannot. You don't understand. You cannot see your, where's your husband? He's back in the field working, but you can't go back there. They said, thank you. They started walking back to where my grandfather was. My grandfather knew what it was, so he started his karate and practice and getting all ready to go. And those two Pentecostal preachers walked up to him and said, said, Mr. Mangan. He said, yeah, I want what my wife got, and I want to get what he's got, and I pray you baptized in the Holy Ghost. And God baptized him with the Holy Ghost, and they baptized him in the name of Jesus. Next picture. There's my daddy. However old my daddy was right there, there's my daddy. There's their whole family. And my grandpa Mangan built that church and they had revival. They had the fire all night long. They established old time tabernacle in Plymouth, Indiana. My grandfather and grandmother put it in my daddy and my daddy had the fires. I thank God that my daddy that the United Pentecostal Church had the opportunity to have G.A. Mangan in the United Pentecostal Church. But it just didn't come from daddy's side. I got it from my mama's side. Lord really had to work on that side. That's my Popsy Gibson. And that's my Momsy Gibson. They get, mother didn't know I was doing this. They gave birth to my mother. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. They started churches all over East Texas. Has anybody ever heard of Lufkin, Texas? Does anybody know what is at Lufkin, Texas? Anybody? Yeah, the Texas District Campground. My grandfather, that man right there, started the first apostolic church in Lufkin, Texas. He started 12 churches. Dibal, where all mother was it? Etal? Thomas Crossing, Wooten, and Allentown. My grandfather started all those churches. I went to see my grandmother who died a couple of years ago at 101. So I went to her and I said, Tell me a story about Pops. She said, honey, I got a good one. I said, what is it? She said, our old cow that gave us our milk, it got sick and laid down and was about to die. And I looked at my daddy, Popsy, and I said, Popsy, if you don't pray for that cow, we're not going to have any milk. She said, I watched Popsy take his oil, go out there and lay his hands on that cow. That cow got up and gave milk.
That's what happened in the previous generation. But it ain't stopping there. It ain't stopping with mother and daddy. It's not stopping with me and Mickey. The greatest generation is the Joshua generation. The greatest revival. You may be seated. My daddy, oh, my sweet daddy. He was preaching a revival in Sunsbury, Pennsylvania, 74 years ago. I was three months old, and he was helping them to bring that work in. My dad was on a seven-day fast, and he didn't say this often because it didn't happen to him often. He said God spoke to him audibly. He said, you will be the next pastor of the church in Alexandria, Louisiana. He said, I have much people in Corinth, Alexandria, and I'm going to give you the whole city. You will possess it. And if time I had, I would tell you about it all, but I don't. He was promised by God as he drove into this city. He walked into this city, and he said, North, you're giving up. And south, you're giving up. And east, you're giving up. And west, you're giving up. Me and Bestelane and the Holy Ghost is taking this city over. So that was that old church. It was an old white building down at 16th and Day, and we slept in the bottom. When I show that picture, of that, that, that's mother and daddy and me. And uh, we were outside of that church. 37 people voted on him. He gathered them all together. He gave them a map of the city, and he divided it up. God said, you do the little things, and I'll be the big things. And it happened with people receiving the Holy Ghost. It just didn't happen. He knocked this city four times. Without him, we cannot, and without us, he they pitched a tent across the street from there, and God honored his word. As I was just a kid and remembered, there were two five-year-olds that came in that building. They were the Vanassaberg boys. They crawled on their hands and their knees like this, and they couldn't walk. And my dad went back to them, the power of God in that tent revival. And the sawdust was a flying, and that black hair with real cream all over it was a flying. He walked back there and he took his all. He said, in the name of Jesus, I lay hands on them. And the, that Vanessa, one of them arms went pop, and one of them arms went pop, and that legs went pop, and that went, went pop, and both those boys got up and walked out. <laughs> there was two men standing outside. Their name was Willie Clayton and Stafford. Uh, what was his last name? Shelton. They were standing outside that tent and they said, I want some of that. God baptized Willie Clayton and Brother Shelton with the Holy Ghost. Willie Clayton became the district superintendent of South Carolina and the whole Shelton family got saved. <laughs> Miracles of the supernatural. This man's mother-in-law was not that down, that and beside him right there. You can stay down. They don't want to see you. <laughs> I'm joking with you. Nobody like Curtis. That man's father-in-law had not received the Holy Ghost about faithful to church, but I'm telling you, everybody preached to him. I mean, Buck Treadway preached hell. Everybody preached everything. They, I mean, they threw every lure they had, and he wouldn't move. And they were sitting over there, and it's when they had pews in this church, and right before church, they said, they, somebody grabbed me out from the front, and they said, He's, he's dead. They, they called the ambulance. The ambulance comes in our church right over there. And they put all that stuff on him and they said, he's dead. I'm telling you, he died right over there. My daddy comes out and he said, man, things feel good in here tonight. I said, daddy. I said, time out, daddy. Let's just, let's don't feel too good right here. He said, what's wrong? I said, the, the ambulance people are here and the man's dead over here. Brother Martin. Yeah, Mr. Martin then. 
My daddy said, what? And he took off and we had pews and he started walking them. He go over and said, excuse me, sir. And he moved them MTs back. He took his all and said, in the name of Jesus, bring life back to this man. That man started shaking. They put him in the ambulance. They took him to the hospital. And three weeks later, he got out of the hospital. That's what Moses did. What is Joshua going to do? Brother Dryden, he was Mr. Dryden. Then, by the way, he got out, came back. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. We baptized him in Jesus' name. And six months later, he went to be with the Lord. Got a hold of my daddy. I was with my mother and daddy. I was just a kid. They took us out to Veterans Hospital. They said his name is Dryden. He's kin to family in your church. They called for him. Then they didn't have oxygen in your nose. They had one of them big oxygen tents. I don't know if you younger was, I don't know if you Joshua's remember those Boses, what we went through. They had oxygen tent. <laughs> they were up under that tent and my daddy walked there with a bottle of ball and he looked down at him. He said, Mr. Dryden, he looked up. They'd given him 24 hours to live. He looked up. Uh, uh, he said, if I pray for you uh, and God heals you, Will you get baptized in Jesus' name and get the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Whatever you say. <laughs> he said, God's going to raise you up. He took his all out. In the name of Jesus, be thy heal. See you later. Daddy walks out, mother gets out, we get out in the hall, and my mother grabs my daddy. My mother was good at grabbing my daddy. Do you know what you just said? Yeah. You told him that if he would get baptized in the Holy Ghost that he was going to live. Yeah, that's what I said. And he said he was. He's supposed to be dead by morning. Can't you see? Mm -hmm. Let's just leave it to God and the doctors. The next day, the doctor walked in and Brother Dryden sitting up on the side of the bed said, I'm ready to go home, Doc. That's my Moses. That's my generation. That's what I saw. That's what was poured into me. He came here. He got the Holy Ghost and we baptized him in Jesus' name. And the doctor said, what in the world happened to you? He said, well, this fellow named Brother Mangan came and prayed for me. And the doctor said, ask my mother, why didn't you tell me Brother Mangan was on this case and i never been worried? <laughs> That's my heritage. 43 years ago, Mickey and I Brought little Michael here from a growing church in Plano and never knew why. Because it was blowing and going in Plano and I didn't want to come home. And Daddy said, it's the will of God. And the reason why I thank God he did, because I get to pass this great POA, but I'm not real sure that's why he brought me home. I'm almost positive he brought me home to start BLTT because it could not have happened in Plano, even though we were growing by hundreds. It could not have happened in Plano because it did not have the foundation under it. And the organization would not have trusted it like they did this place. And so I came here. And Brother Huntley was preaching one time. And I've forgiven him. I've taken communion over. And he walked over to me, if you'll remember, and said, Man, you ought to be able to preach. You got GA invested. I had an alcoholic for daddy. I wanted to look up and say, Do you know how hard it is to follow GA investor? <laughs> and now, Gentry, you got GA invested in Mickey to follow. <laughs> for the past 42 years, we've been here. We've knocked doors three or four times. Every door did it just year before last. Mickey and I, through God's anointing and help from people in front, Grace House, House of Mercy, Vent Center, baptizing many people every year, to which I'm thankful for worship on the liver. River John, would you stand, please? John, there he is right there. Mickey and I started. This was when, thank you, John. You may be seated. This is when, 
the whites didn't go down to Lee Street and the blacks didn't come to the other side of Bowdoin Avenue. This is when I graduated from Bowdoin without one African American in our class. This was a very unusual time. And I told Mickey, I said, I've got such a burden for the black community. I can't help it. She said, well, let's do something. I said, okay. So I went down to uh, Clark Dunbar building. I told Dad, he said, well, go for it. I went down and we started that church. And brother, we called it here because it was still a very racial, racial time. Still have racism. Everybody say, we still have racism and we need to continue to work on it. We all need to get better. But it was really bad back then. And I remember putting an usher on, and one usher grabbed me and said, you put this uh, man on our usher team? I said, yes, sir. He said, all your ushers are going to quit. I said, good. I've always wanted to usher. Because <laughs> I was determined we're breaking through barriers. We're going to build a church in Corinth. It doesn't matter what color, what creed, what nationality. We're going to build a church in Corinth. So I said, God, let it happen. You did it for my daddy. If you did it for my daddy, you would do it for me. And I was preaching along one time, and I heard a commotion going on over here, like it was when that, dad, that one died and daddy brought up his commotion going on over here, and it was Sister Thorpe. And I said, Sister Thorpe, I'm preaching. She said, I know it, but I can't help it, Pastor. I said, why can't you help? She said, I brought this deaf lady to church, and her ears just popped open. Moses, I'm filing like my daddy. I'm trying to be like my daddy. So they called and said, Brenda Tarver's not going to live. So Mickey and I got through and we got in the airplane. We took off down to New Orleans, Louisiana and Brenda Tarver was dying. I've showed you a picture of that before. I don't have it now. She was all wired up and they'd given her just hours for her to live. And we walked into that room and I anointed and prayed and, and I said, I believe we're going to believe God and Tarver's here tonight. And he said, you know, let's just believe whatever's going to happen, going to happen. And I was getting ready to walk out when this, my bride, went into that lumpkin tongue that she has. And she started laying her hand on Brenda Tarver. And all of a sudden, there's life begin to come. And, and, and Brenda got out of that hospital and she came home and she lived for years after that because one anointed vessel of God laid hands on her and prayed for her. Yes, I've seen it in my generation. Yes, I've seen the dead raised in my generation. Yes, I've seen it happen. And now Pastor Gentry and Pastor Andrew, Pastor Ryan, Pastor Gary, Pastor Andrew and Danielle started small groups and it's starting to move great and it's going fantastic. But you'll see signs all over the city and you'll see them all over the state. If you've seen one, you can say, man, if not, okay. But there's signs that are posted, billboards that said, in a jam, call Sam. Okay. Well, in a jam called Sam got the Holy Ghost last year and his wife, and we baptized. They were going to be here tonight, but they got sick this summer. So, you know, I've had uh, Gentry and Andrew got to have theirs. So they were out by their pool in a jam called Sam was out by his pool. He and Abby, and they had their little baby girl with them. And they had finished, and they had done hamburgers, and they had put everything away, and he took the life jacket off of his baby. And uh, his wife got preoccupied over here and he went to the other end of the pool and they turned around and looked, where's the baby and where's the baby? And, and there was no baby. And so Sam went rushing back to the end of the pool and that baby, wasn't Andrew, that baby was at the bottom of that pool in a jam called Sam. Reached down and picked up that baby. It was not breathing. The baby was purple and blue. He started pumping, water started coming out. He picked it up and started giving it and no breath, no life. And when you get in a jam, Sam didn't call Sam. When Sam got in a jam, Sam knew who to call. It was Jesus. Jesus. Call Pastor Gentry. Get to church, pray. Call Pastor Gentry. Pumped again. That baby went, <gasps> that baby started breathing. 
and life came to that baby. That baby was raised from the dead in that pool. That baby was raised from the dead. It's our generation. It's the Joshua generation. It's the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. This ark, this Holy Ghost that we have, get on your feet and shout to the Lord. This ark still works. But it doesn't come easy. God doesn't fill up things until you dig ditches. And when you dig the ditch, he'll fill it full of water. And when you take the arrows and smite the ground, he'll give you the victory. When you roll away the stone, he'll bring out that which was dead from the midst thereof. And I'm going to close with this. Habakkuk, for I will work a work in your day, Joshua, which ye will not believe, though it be told to you. Joshua, I'm getting ready to do for you what nothing else could do. But I watched him, him, and I watched her. I live with them. Jacob wrestled with God. He changed his name and he changed a nation. Isaiah cried out to God and when he did, God took the coals off of the altar and touched his lips and he became a man. Boy, he was telling everybody how to do it in Isaiah 5, but when he got to Isaiah 6, he said, I'm unclean. I'm not even worthy to preach anymore. As did Moses, the burning bush, and Joshua. They arose and went after it. And where we get it is lingering in the temple and burning bush experience. So I declare in this room tonight, anointing not leaving me, nor any of us, nor Brother Huntler, Mike, or all these men right here, the anointing is not leaving us. We're here and going to see the greatest revival in our lives and ministry that we've seen. But I am officially at Because of the Times 40 telling you, the next few years of Joshua's is getting ready to be the greatest revival that the church has ever seen. But it won't come easy. I would like for you to sit back down and for however long you want to inquire, I would like for you to kneel down. Those of you in the second row probably can't so you can sit down. And I would like for there to be just a moment if there be no one moving right now. I would like there to be a moment that would cry out from my innermost being with a desperate. God, I'm ready for the Joshua to fall. I'm ready to see a revival. I'm ready to see the dead raise of blind eyes. I'm ready to see the greatest Holy Ghost revival that the church has ever seen. How much do you want it? Go after it for just a few minutes. How much do we want the revival? How bad do we want the Holy Ghost? How much do we want this dispensation? That's it, missionaries. I speak it over you. I speak it over our missionaries. I speak it over. I speak it to those of you in the balcony through the authority and the unction of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Oh, 
Men, would you lift your voices to God? Come on, pastors. Come on, evangelists. Come on, lift your voices from the depths of your soul. Let there be a, something flow from your innermost being. Let there be something flow. Let there be something flow. Come on, Joshua, linger. Come on, Moses, let God speak to you. Come on, Joshua generation. Come on, T.W. Barnes for this generation. Come on, G.A. Mangan for this generation. Come on, T.F. Tenney for this generation. Would all you ladies lift your voice and pray over us right now? Would the ladies lift their voice? When Zion travails, babes are born. Come on, ladies, lift your voice. There's nobody can travail like a woman. Lift your voice. Let a travail be in the congregation.
Men, lift your voices to God. Come on, men, lift your voices. Come on, pastors. Let a well spring up from my innermost being.
When you feel like you need to go, feel free to leave, but we won't dismiss this service. Let's go over Jordan. Let's go over Jordan together. Joshua, when Joshua picked this up, the river was at flood stage. And the Bible said, when this moved into the water, that those waters divided. And Joshua let this in the middle of the river, and it dried up until every person got across. This is in front of us. And you, your family, your children, I don't care what it looks like right now, all of our family is going across Jordan. This is not going any further till all of our family gets over Jordan. 